So uh, welcome everyone to the panel on the FNIH and NIH initiative on, called AMPGT or BGTC, and you will be hearing a lot about what these acronyms mean in a few minutes. Uh, we have a very esteemed panel here that has uh, in, insight into all aspects of this initiative, and uh, we will spend some time describing it to you. Uh, and then talking a little bit further about the involvement of different parties in this initiative and telling you a little bit more about the execution of it. Um, we have uh, Joe Manetsky from uh, FNIH, PG, PJ Brooks from NIH, Bob Smith from Pfizer, Barry Byrne from University of Florida, and myself, Yael Weiss from Ultragenics Pharmaceutical. Uh, we'll start first, uh, I'll let each panelist introduce themselves, and then we'll move into um, discussing the initiative. Um, Joe, would you like to start and introduce yourself, please? Sure. My name is Joe Minetsky. I'm the Associate Vice President of Research Partnerships at the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health. I've been working here uh, for the last five years, setting up large public-private partnerships to support the the mission of NIH. Um, we have some unique characteristics uh, that allow us to, to um, be a very safe haven for partnerships that are between uh, external private, um, private indiv individuals as well as, as um, entities and the NIH, things that other people would not be able to do. Um, and um, prior to that, and, and so we have been working as part of the the, the research partnerships group on the program that we're going to talk about today, the AMP Gene Therapy Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium. Uh, and it, we've been doing that for the last about year. Uh, and um, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to provide some insight into that. And just to give you a little bit additional background in, in my world, I've spent uh, the previous 20 some years in, in big pharma. So I'm, a, I'm kind of an industry person um, with, a, with now a very much of a public private partnership view of the world. Thank you, Joe. Uh, PJ? Yes, hi, I'm uh, PJ Brooks. I'm a program director in the Office of Rare Diseases Research at NCATS, part of the NIH. Uh, and I've been representing NCATS and NIH on the AMP GT effort and happy to be here and talk about it. Thank you, Barry. Hi there, I'm Barry Byrne. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the University of Florida and director of the Powell Gene Therapy Center here. Um, I've been working in the area of rare disease gene therapy for about the last 20 years and I'm delighted to participate in the panel today. Thank you, and Bob? Hi, I'm Bob Smith, um, Senior Vice President of the Gene Therapy Business here at Pfizer within our Rare Disease Business Unit. And uh, thank you for including me on the panel. Um, I'm also a member of the Board of Directors of, of ARM as well as the Executive Committee and very pleased to be joining uh, my fellow panelists for this interesting topic. Thank you. And I'll just introduce myself briefly. I'm Yael Weiss. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Ultragenics. We're a, a California-based company focused on rare and ultra-rare genetic diseases. Um, a few years ago, we acquired Dimension Therapeutics, which uh, enabled us to have our own gene therapy unit. And we are now spending a lot of time on gene therapy for liver, liver disorders and metabolic disorders and also CNS disorders. Um, we um, also um, cover different therapeutic modalities such as mRNA, antisense oligonucleotides, proteins, enzyme replacement therapies. And um, having this broad uh, reach into different modalities allows us to actually try to match the best therapeutic modality for each genetic disorder that we decide to treat. Um, we also, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, do treat some ultra, ultra rare diseases. Our smallest disease is uh, predicted to have 200 patients worldwide. But obviously, um, since we are a publicly traded company, we have um, larger diseases, and we will always have a slot or two for ultra, ultra rare diseases. As, and knowing that there's so many of them, we're very appreciative of the, 
BGTC, BGTC uh, effort and the FNIH and NIH effort. Thank you. So um, now that we're done with introductions, uh, I will hand it over to Joe and PJ to tell you a little bit about the, about the initiative, how it came about, and um, what we did in the last year to make it happen. This is a, the, the cover slide for the meeting that we had on, Octo, on August 26th, which was uh, the culmination of a, a year's worth of work uh, to pull together what could be addressed in a large public-private partnership within gene therapy. Um, Dr. Peter Marks from Siever has been a, uh, a central player in this, as has PJ and uh, Gopa, and also uh, you can see Seng Chen from Pfizer has also been a, a big player in this, and as well as a number of other Pfizer folks. Um, the, this approach and this thought came out of a uh, an initial discussion with big uh, pharma group at, called the Hever Group um, some uh, time ago it was recognized that there was issues with the gene therapy that were just um, coming to, to everyone's uh, uh, view. And uh, there was a, a chance, an expectation that by working together in a, in a large partnership, some of the challenges of the, the gene therapy area could be surmounted to make it more uh, available and accessible to groups that were not, you know, the big giant uh, groups of, of people that could, could all be addressed. And so that's where the gene therapy bespoke gene therapy um, consortium has, has, has grown out of. Uh, it's it's had a, and I will show you that it's had a lot of input from uh, all corners of the 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 field, including many of the people who you're going to hear speaking today, um, but also many many others, and um, I think it is also trying to address those things that are not being addressed in other areas like IMI or or some of the other uh, groups that uh, that European groups as as well as some other. Uh, groups that have, uh, are addressing specific aspects of, of gene therapy. So um, th with that as a little bit of background, um, I'll go to the next slide, which is uh, cut to the, ch you know, kind of cutting to the chase, what we ended up with. And so after this time, we really ended up with um, a program that splits off, splits into two big areas that were recognized as major needs within the, uh, the area. The first is the understanding of AAV basic biology and, and its translational implementations. AAV was chosen because it seemed to be by the, the group the furthest along in terms of being able being used and, and being able to, to start to think about standardizing. But it was also recognized as um, the, the potential for uh, utility in, in, in very small populations to, was, was expected, was thought to be very high. However, um, it's been a, uh, you know, a, a victim of its own success in the sense that AV seems to work quite well. And so it's being used quite a bit, but the actual background of basic biology isn't as well characterized as one might hope in order to make the advances in uh, manufacturing and, and um, delivery that you might have in, a, in, in something that was significantly more um, understood. So one of the areas is understanding the basic biology and I'll get into the, how we're addressing, how the, the, the consortium is trying to address that. The other thing is uh, the other section is advancing the access to AAV technologies and vectors. And this is being uh, approached uh, by what we've been calling a sub part of this, the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium, which uh, PJ will be talking about in more depth. And so I'm not going to go into it, but suffice it to say, it's an approach to standardize the, the, the generation and delivery of, of vectors such that it's a clear path for all 
Um, so with, with that, I'm going to go to the, the folks who have been involved in the basic biology. I told you there was a lot. You can see there is. And they come from all walks of life, but, uh, you know, and the field, both high uh, and large pharma, small pharma, various uh, institutes within the NIH. Uh, the FDA has been extremely involved, as well as uh, academics. And so um, there, this is a, um, this is a very uh, strong scientific group of, of folks that are that have had input into into this. Um, the the um, general strategy that uh, the group has come up with is is one that wouldn't be taken on by any one company or institute or uh, institution uh, by themselves, and that is to look at trying to identify ways of advancing and understanding AAV biology that are, are supported through high throughput functional genomic screening. Um, this is something that, that many places can do, uh, but uh, in particular NCATS, who uh, PJ is, is involved in, or works for, um, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. It's, it's an approach to actually be uh, looking at the biology in a um, unbiased way to identify those areas where uh, the the process could be enhanced by just understanding uh, better biology. And so um, we're thinking that this could possibly be done at NCATS. There is a central facility, but it would re require a lot of input from, from external uh, players to help us identify the best screens, the best approaches. There might be some interest in looking at libra uh, libraries of approved drugs to see if they have effects on on various aspects of the the um, the, uh, the the process. And then there will probably be some focused funding on specific questions that aren't covered by HTS approaches and may actually be generated during the process of the studies in, in the high throughput screening where we need a little bit more detail and it requires a, a more focused approach. So that's the, the biology part. I'm gonna toss this over to uh, PJ now to talk about the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium and the, the approaches that we're, we're looking about, looking, thinking about there. PJ? Great, thanks Joe. So yes, I'll be, this is a slide to illustrate the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium, or BGTC, as I'll refer to it. And we think of it, at, and, and this idea really kind of was envisioned by, by Peter Marks from CBER. It's kind of a nonprofit umbrella organization to, to help streamline the process of going through an idea for gene therapy for a rare disease, all the way through starting up a clinical trial, and really trying to take advantage of uh, past successes uh, knowledge about AAV, using AAV serotypes that have already been in patients, and trying to really take advantage of the, the platform capacity of AAV as a delivery tool for delivering therapeutic genes to different cell types, which could be applied to multiple diseases. And an important aspect too is that this is intended to be sort of a learning system as we go through the process and all the results from these treatments will be reported back to the consortium for iterative learning uh, to the benefit of everyone in the field. But with a particular focus on diseases that are of, of no commercial interest. If I could have the next slide. So the basic strategy here is to address the needs of, of ultimately getting sort of a simple AV generation production clinical trials manual. You can almost think of it as like a maniatus for gene therapy for those of us who are of the appropriate age to remember the maniatus, uh, like their <laughs> biology manuals. Um, they're really focused on coordinating and harmonizing the production of vectors for uh, the most efficient and cost effective delivery. And we'll be running, we anticipate running five or six pilot projects for disease of different prevalence, dose requirements, and routes of administration, a limited number of AAV vectors develop and implementing an algorithmic approach to select target diseases um, by analysis of existing databases, as well as considerations of what is really going to benefit our pilot here. 
Um, and then also, I think an important aspect, particularly for this audience, is the idea of the goal of standardizing vector quantitation, toxicity testing, and lot release assays of the different vectors, because that will really help us to understand some of the, the clinical findings. Next slide. So a little more detail about this, we anticipate working with both uh, industry vector manufacturers and also academic manufacturers put to produce the vectors for these, these five to six pilots. Again, limited number of serotypes, different manufacturing scales, uh, different routes of administration. And the sort of idea is that the, the transgene sequence is the only difference being introduced. It'll go into established manufacturing uh, paradigms uh, for these clinical trials, but also a consistent testing process within the BGTC to help harmonize and, and understand better the results. Next slide. So a key question too comes to how we're going to choose diseases for this pilot. And again, I think it's important to highlight that this is a, a pilot for trying to improve the efficiency of, of gene therapy for disease of no commercial interest. It's not simply the goal to choose six diseases and do gene therapy for six diseases. We're trying to learn something from the pilot. So keeping that in mind is I think very important. But with that in mind, we, we have potentially thousands of monogenic diseases that could be uh, potentially uh, amenable to this process. And the question is how, do we gonna, how are we gonna winnow this down to the five or six that we're gonna test? Um, we've developed draft criteria by representatives from government, industry, academia, bioethics, and patient advocacy, including Yale and uh, others who are here, um, trying to get a complementary set of diseases to allow the results to be of maximum generalizability and potential benefit to the field. Um, and again, highlighting this is a pilot in which we hope to be learning as we go along. Next slide. In terms of the clinical trials and carrying out these clinical trials, we anticipate some of them, many of them multi-site trials, and where possible, we hope to leverage already existing NIH-funded clinical trial programs, like, for example, the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network um, within the NIH, the NINDS Neuronext, the, the CTSA program, uh, potentially the NIH Clinical Center, but also other established clinical trial uh, entities they, you know, not necessarily ones that are funded by the NIH. We want to go to the places where we can get these trials done uh, most efficiently. There'll be a single IRB for the entire BGTC. Uh, we'll have a board of expert clinicians to guide treatments and learning because we anticipate some of these trials will be done at places where they've not done AAV gene therapy before. And it's important to understand what to expect um, and even plan to pilot test visiting research nurses to allow administration of gene therapy in areas outside of academic medical centers because you really want this uh, pilot to really think about how we can get these treatments to patients that need them wherever they are um, and not just in the big academic medical centers. I think that's a really important goal. Next slide. And in terms of assay standardization, harmonization, again, something of great interest to ARM. Um, I think one thing that will be interesting and, and unique about this is that while we'll have different vectors made in different uh, uh, places, acad academia or industry, we'll have one standardized approach to vector quantitation and other types of vector analyses. Um, so that when we do carry out the, the results of the testing, I mean, I mean, and carry out the clinical trials, we will have some of these results to help us interpret the, the, the clinical results. And the NIH will be involved in, in overseeing this centralized testing facility and conduct the supplemental testing and also coordinate the other types of testing necessary, including toxicity, vector potency, et cetera, uh, as well as overseeing the clinical trials and also be the IND holder. Next slide. And these are some of the working groups, again, who've worked on both the manufacturing analytics and clinical development in the, the BGTC. Uh, many people involved from NIH and industry and very much appreciate all of their time. Uh, I, I'd like to turn to, to the other participants of the panel and um, hear a little bit more about how the 
you personally and your respective organizations plan to to take part in this initiative and maybe start with Barry who, come, who gives us the academic perspective. You've been working in the AAV gene therapy field for many years. Um, how do you see yourself and the University of Florida contributing to this initiative? Will it be more um, uh, clinical trials, basic research, next generation capsids? Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Barry, you're on mute. Yeah, thank you for, for the lead into that. Um, and uh, just about 30 years ago, uh, basic scientists in, in the molecular genetics group, so virologists at the University of Florida, helped establish the concept of AV as a vector. Uh, and then about 20 years ago, uh, there was an initiative to develop a more translational aspect to these uh, early findings. And um, that's when I joined the group um, and moved from Baltimore to, to, to Gainesville and started to build the efforts to, um, uh, to develop this platform for clinical use. And um, this was uh, strongly supported by the NIH in the early period. Uh, we had um, program grants both from NINDS, um, NIAMS, and NHLBI. Uh, and uh, and the uh, the Diabetes Foundation, and so we over the past ten years really have focused on uh, small population studies. So very much like is um, anticipated um, for for the uh, the BGTC, and uh, actually have uh, done a number now of of uh, patient specific or uh, treatment INDs for, for, for specific small indications that would not be amenable to commercialization. Um, and then in my um, clinical role as the, uh, the head of the Muscular Dystrophy Association Supported Care Center here, um, we focus also on developing best practices in the neuromuscular space. And I've had the opportunity to work on several studies which have taught us a lot about both uh, safety and, um, and, and factors that contribute to safety and efficacy in studies in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, Pompe disease. Um, we have an upcoming uh, study in Barth syndrome, which is gonna be very much like um, uh, the BGTC would be uh, focused on. And, um, and then in my personal experience, I had um, the, the honor of doing the first commercial infusion of Zolgensma, which is for, as a pediatrician, uh, focusing on neuromuscular disease. It's been really interesting to see how, um, how contributions from industry have helped accelerate this field. So that, that's uh, at least my overall perspective. I see uh, there is a lot uh, to learn still. And uh, particularly when, uh, even though we've, um, we've uh, worked in this area for a while, I feel strongly that we need to do a lot to educate others about how to safely conduct these studies. Because these are not uh, very conventional uh, medicines in the, in the usual sense of other infusion therapies or biologics. It's probably the only, uh, the only type of um, medical therapy that once the infusion is complete, uh, there's actually no way to reverse that. Uh, that is, in effect, a permanent alteration of that person's uh, cellular DNA. Um, and so that has implications for, uh, for participation in other studies, unless there's a preventative strategy used to block immune responses. Um, it has implications for the clinical outcomes that have, and availability of, of that individual to participate in small molecule uh, programs which may be relevant to their disease because they now have uh, quite different than, uh, than their peer patient population. So those are some of the things that will be at issue as we go through this experience and help to, to generalize and make available these, um, uh, the underpinnings of this field to others in, this, in the rare disease space. Thanks, Barry. Can you can you say a few words about the trial designs for gene therapy? Uh, my experience is that the, the cohorts are very small uh, normally, but I, I don't, 
is the limitation because of uh, manufacturing or because you can actually see an effect with small patients? Yeah, there, well, uh, there are an important aspect to that. So as you point out, um, you know, unlike a conventional drug, uh, where drug discovery may take many years and, uh, and involves screening of tens of thousands of compounds. In a genetically defined disease, one anticipates the exact um, best therapeutic is known because the causative gene is known. And um, obviously there can be uh, alternative pathways that, that get involved in more complex polygenic uh, conditions. But for most recessive conditions at least, and even um, the ability to, to do gene silencing, so even for dominant conditions, uh, there's a possibility to use a very specific agent that would have a very large effect size. So therefore the studies can in fact be smaller. One limitation uh, thus far kind of, of gene therapy studies in general is that they've all been um, open, open label studies uh, initially to establish or confirm dose that poses problems in that, say, early dose cohorts may be ineligible to um, receive the full effect of the approved therapy once the, the most effective dose is identified. And it also, um, it also takes away one of the more powerful aspects of clinical study design in, uh, that's afforded by blinding. Um, we do think that some of the a technology that we've been focusing on to block immune responses and allow dose crossover studies that are blinded would, um, would add additional power to the small study populations that are commonly seen in this area. Um, and that's going to be particularly relevant for the ultra-orphan indications because one might have treated half of the worldwide patient population just in one study and then if you've not actually demonstrated um, the efficacy of the approach, then how would you go about doing that with just few remaining patients left? So um, it's very important to, for the sustainability of any of these efforts to try to do it right the first time, um, use the absolute best quality products, which are gonna impact safety. And that's one of the um, goals of the, of the BGTC consortium. Um, and, uh, and then we'll all learn together by using common assays and open source approaches to, uh, to improve uh, this field, which is a, really the, has the potential to truly change clinical practice um, and, uh, and reach patient populations for which there were no alternative therapies. So we're obviously very excited about that aspect. Thank you. Um, I'll come back to you with additional questions later, but we'll move to, Bob from Pfizer, uh, can you tell us a little bit about Pfizer's involvement, your, your personal involvement, Pfizer's involvement, and um, how you see the future of Pfizer's involvement in this initiative? Yes, well, thank you again for including me on the panel. And I'd like to start by applauding the efforts of Joe and PJ and their teams at the Foundation for the NIH in the NIH, as well as Peter Marks and his team at the FDA for the great work they've done to bring this conversation to the point we are now of almost realizing uh, the completion of the consortium and the initiation of the pilot. And at Pfizer, our involvement has been um, from the initial uh, conversations led by Michael Dolson, who's our president of worldwide research and, and development and medical, who is a member of the Hever uh, meeting group and Feng Chang, who's the Chief Scientific Officer of our Rare Disease Research Unit, and other members of our collective research team involved in gene therapies. And my our primary motivation for being involved is, as Barry outlined, this is a very complicated area of medicine and science. Uh, challenges essentially at every turn or step along the way. And with the, the ultimate goal of bringing these gene therapies to as many patients as possible as soon as we can, I think the multi-stakeholder approach of including participants from both the public sector, uh, academic centers, industry, patient advocacy groups, I think our collective uh, efforts will lead to a much better outcome than if any individual group tried to solve these complex set of issues by themselves. And I thought it was emblematic on one of Joe's slides where he had the four core efforts of 
vector generation, understanding gene expression, clinical development paradigms for these ultra rare diseases, and then the manufacturing aspects. He had those four pillars connected by a chain. And I would, I would probably offer up that our ultimate goal is to bring as many gene therapies to as many patients as soon as we can, that our ability to do that is really going to be dependent upon what is the weakest link in that chain of connecting those four pillars. And so I think the multi-stakeholder approach is probably the best way to get there. Um, I know that a lot of thinking by many, many capable uh, members of the consortium have led us to this point. And I think now um, with the benefit of the work to date, the real, the real final push here in the next few months, I know we have a goal of trying to, to get this put in place by the end of the year, I think is highly achievable. And I'm very glad that we're able to use the meeting on the Mesa and the support of ARM to bring this story to life to as many of the ARM members as we can, who may not have been either aware or involved with it to date. But I think the collective good here is, is that the more the better in terms of how best to advance this effort and not to put too much of a plug in for, for Joe and the foundation, but this also requires commitments from the participants, either in-kind commitments of individuals' expertise, time and energy with, with financial um, investment and commitments. And so I would also just encourage our members um, to really think about what your level of participation could be to help advance the very noble goal of the consortium. Thank you, Bob. Um, I'd like to ask you a question about manufacturing. It seems like now when you look at the portfolio of diseases that are having gene therapy developed for, it's, there's a sweet spot of a number of patients that's based on, on one hand, probably the ability to make vector. On the other hand, the, com the commercial um, commercialability of it, you know, is there a way to get a return on the investment of making this vector? Uh, and, and at Pfizer, I, I assume as a big company, you'd like to eventually treat very large patient populations. On the other hand, we're talking about very small patient populations. Can you talk a little bit about the scaling up and down of, of manufacturing for very small patient populations versus very big patient populations like Alzheimer's or cardiovascular disease or diabetes and whatnot? Yeah, well, certainly we have uh, made significant investment in AAV manufacturing, both in terms of capabilities, expertise, and capacity. And within our portfolio, uh, today we now have three manufacturing facilities that are scaled from research grade, um, and what I would describe as research scale, where we produce from 10 liter uh, wave bag bioreactors up to 250 liter uh, single-use bioreactors, and that's what we call our research capability manufacturing plant, which is in Kid Creek, North Carolina. Then we have a separate clinical facility where we operate using the same processes with cell suspension, HEC-293 cells, for clinical use, and that's in a GMP facility at GMP processes at 500 liter scale. And then we have a pivotal and commercial manufacturing facility where we use the same process but a 2,000 liter scale. Um, we publicly disclosed that we are now operating with three 2,000 liter bioreactors soon to add another eight. So it's a pretty significant investment. And I think where we have designed our capabilities is to address those diseases where there is a commercial um, viability. And our role in the consortium in areas where we know that there's a big gap is, where are we gonna do for patients where the technology is amenable to give a transformational clinical benefit, but it's really about manufacturing the regulatory framework, the clinical development challenges that Barry spoke to, and how can we deliver? So, you know, from an economic perspective, there's a fixed cost to manufacture, let's just say a batch of AV that could be used for both research purposes, and maybe potentially for clinical. And I think a lot of the work that we would do to streamline the analytical processes have almost like a templated uh, type of cookbook, so to speak, on how best and most efficiently to manufacture AAV for these ultra rare diseases. Well, I think will enable us collectively across both the academic manufacturing centers 
plus industry manufacturing centers to produce for more diseases than any individual company could ever do on their own. Thank you. Uh, so I'll just say a few words about Ultragenics and our um, involvement in the program. Um, we, as I said before, we are a company that's focused on rare and ultra rare genetic diseases. And um, as uh, the time goes by, we get a lot of inquiries from patients and foundations, patient advocates uh, on, first of all, whether we would be interested in trying to develop a therapy for their disease or can we support the, support the organization or the individuals in any way. So um, this is something that we've been um, thinking about for a long time. How can we actually support as many organizations as we can, even though our pipeline is uh, it can be only a, a, of a certain number and not infin, not infin, not to infinity. So um, when I um, was approached by Joe from the FNIH um, and he told me about this initiative, I, I felt that it resonates uh, very much with the ultragenics vision and strategy. And um, it was very interesting to see how this evolved from an idea to to actually happening and hopefully launching soon. Um, it really bring allows Ultragenics to bring to the table um, our, on one hand, gene therapy expertise. Um, we will pull in people into the uh, consortium uh, as needed, uh, whether it's scientific expertise or clinical uh, trial expertise, endpoint design expertise. Um, and, and uh, support any um, effort or disease that the, that the BGTC decides to work on. And um, on the other hand, we can also um, provide the, the, any, any input that's needed for later stages of development, including um, as trial design. Um, you know, I asked Barry about trial design. We have a lot of expertise and a specific group that actually focuses on trial design and um, help think through the different diseases based on patient numbers, based on endpoints, what the best way to actually um, show that a gene therapy is working is. Um, and and I, I guess this actually um, takes me back to uh, asking maybe PJ how important it is to have uh, natural history data for these uh, diseases that we will eventually choose or to pilot, and then the ones that we would work on later. And is this something that we would expect foundations to uh, provide us with, or is it something that's exist existing already? Um, I'm sure a lot of people are asking themselves whether they should now embark on natural history studies or start prepping for gene therapy studies. Yes, I think obviously, that having natural history data or at the very least clear clinical outcome data, preferably based on natural history is, is very important. And I think that would be a major consideration in the choosing the diseases for study in this pilot. Um, you know, we highlighted, I highlighted the NIH Rare Disease Clinical Research Network, which is something that we oversee along with other NIH partners. In that program, we've got I think roughly 200 diseases under study in different consortia. But one of the key points there is that a requirement for all the RDCRN projects is uh, at least one natural history study. So we actually have quite a lot of diseases in there that already have the natural history data and you know, that would facilitate them going into trial. But of course there are other diseases where there's good natural history data as well. But I see that as a, as a really critical requirement uh, because I think this 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 effort can't support the natural history studies. We kind of need ones where there's already the good data that that we can you know you know get ready to go right to the trial. Thanks, Barry. What do what do you think about the natural history uh, studies and from your experience working on ultra rare disorders? Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, many foundations initiated um, those efforts to try to better understand, um, and even long before, long before these modalities were available, 
really just as a way of uh, effectively characterizing their patient community. And so um, I think it, it is partly an outgrowth of the 21st Century uh, Cures Act where um, there's a, there's, it's known that uh, having this natural history data really, uh, really helps establish what the basis for an effective treatment might be if, if one could, could establish change from, from the natural history cohort. And, and it may be in the, in the BGTC that, um, that, that that'll be critically important because there won't be possible to have a control arm in studies in which there may only be a, just a handful of, of individuals and you rely on the historical cohort to progressively over time show uh, through some Bayesian analysis a separation from the natural history and, an, and a new um, altered natural history based on the gene correction. Um, I have a question to uh, Joe or PJ or Bob, whoever can answer it. Um, so let's say the, the a disease is chosen. Um, there are, are 50 patients known in the world. 10 or 15 are treated in the clinical trial. Another 10 or 15 are treated the following year because these patients have been identified already. What will happen in the future? What, what's the plan to actually um, maintain the ability to treat these patients as they're identified in the future? So I think that's a, a, actually a great question. It's been addressed a couple of times within the discussions, uh, particularly in the clinical trial group. And, um, you know, it, it a little bit depends on, on how much of the vector is generated and how much is left over and things like that. But um, I think that's something that would have to be, um, we still have a few questions that we, and a few things that need to be worked out that would have to be uh, worked out because it would be depend, it, you know, it, it, if during the course of the process you made enough to treat everyone in the world, um, then that would be there for treatment. If part of the process, you know, during the process, you only could make enough for five uh, patients or something, um, then there would have to be some expectation or some approach to to continuing to make sure that those those patients get the, the additional patients get get um, access. I mean, it's still part of the access view, and um, my guess is is that even if Peter is looking at this, Peter Marks, uh, the FDA is looking at this as a not for profit like endeavor, which I like. Um, that doesn't mean it's not gonna be without some cost. And so we're gonna to have to also figure out how to make sure that those people um, can get that. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll let PJ talk further, but it's, I think, you know, some of those details are still uh, to be worked out. Yeah, I guess I could add that it certainly is an interesting question. I'm, and I'm wondering about the perspective from from industry on this, because it's one thing to say from an industry perspective, I'm going to think about developing a treatment for disease essentially from scratch and, you know, make the vector and, and do all the proof of concept studies and carry out the early clinical trial. But if you know, are in a situation where the data already exists in human beings showing that the treatment is effective, then the industry perspective seems to me to be quite different. You're thinking about do I want to pick this up and, and license it? And that calculation might be very different than starting from scratch. So um, I think we don't know the answer, but, but that is my hope that, you know, how many patients is enough, is, is too little to, to develop a, a treatment for disease from scratch. The answer might be very different if you've already seen that the treatment works and it's just a matter of making more. Um, but I, I don't know, but that, that would be one, Thing, question I have, and, and maybe Yale and, and Bob might want to comment on that, and Barry too. Anybody? And I can, you know, I can say that um, for enzyme replacement therapies, as time went by and it became less expensive to make enzyme, and the processes 
became almost like what you talked about, like there's a manual to make enzymes. Uh, obviously, it became easier and more accessible to make enzyme replacement therapies. And this is one of the reasons that enabled us to bring in an ultra, ultra rare disease of less than 200 patients and develop an enzyme replacement therapy for it. So I imagine that, or I hope that as time goes by and uh, manufacturing processes become more um, routine and the, the price of making vector would go down, then it will be easier to also pick up from a commercial perspective, from an industry perspective, these ultra, ultra rare diseases. But I, I, I'm not sure we're there yet. And Bob and Barry, I'd like to hear what you think. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I use an analogy <clears throat> so uh, the current the current cost of goods for making a monoclonal antibody is about two hundred dollars uh, for a gram of product. If you made an equal amount of an AV product, uh, the cost would be about five million dollars in today. Um, so we have a long way to go. I, I'm not sure that in the evolution of the antibody uh, the antibody field that the cost of goods for a single dose of an antibody were ever in the range they are now. So there's a lot to do um, to improve on costs. But that, that to your point, is, is just the very driver of what um, influences market size and um, uh, for viability. Because uh, if the cost of developing the drug is far greater than um, you know, then the market population would ever allow for those R&D costs to be recovered. But that's going to be a disincentive for any public entity, or at least for a profit entity, <clears throat> to develop those drugs. And even if they were in the private sector um, uh, or in some cost plus model, it still has to be affordable to the organizations that would support that, whether it's patient-specific foundations and, you know, Every every week, uh, pr practically, uh, I get contacted by an, another family with a different condition where there's N of one or, or six uh, individuals known. And that's, that's um, partly influenced by the advent of genetic diagnostic testing using whole exome sequencing. So this is a a benefit, if you will, of the <clears throat> of the of the genome era that we're in of molecular medicine, but it also um, puts out of reach to many of these families a specific treatment for that uh, really rare indication. And so there's a disparity there that's really challenging. And then I'll make my last point is that, and 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 Bob can comment on this as a global organization. Um, the rare disease community is in effect now linked uh, worldwide. They're not yeah. really just in the U.S. where where there might be a more favorable reimbursement. So we cr create even more disparity uh, towards access uh, when you think about the worldwide patient community, and not not just even in the developed countries where there's are advanced medical practices, but really all over the world. Yeah, thanks for those comments, Barry. But you know, I think I think what we're hopeful to have as a um, a byproduct outcome of the initial efforts of the consortium pilot is that many of these challenging barriers to access, delivery, long-term follow-up care of patients who are treated with gene therapies is that the advent of technologies and the ability um, to leverage additional tools that any individual mm -hmm. company may have, but collectively aren't shared, um, may benefit the overall objective of the consortium to treat as many patients as we can, as soon as we can. Um, and I just maybe take a, a little bit of a, a learning from the efforts of industry, regulatory bodies, academic groups here with the COVID pandemic and how the level of cooperation and collaboration has significantly increased um, across all members of that development cycle to the benefit of, of you know, all of us collectively. So I think, you know, my, my view is, is that at every step along the way, we're gonna have these different types of challenges, whether they're scientific, manufacturing, analytical, regulatory, clinical, 
and probably most importantly, if you look at the globalization of being able to deliver and make affordable and, and accessible as many of these gene therapies that what we learned from the pilot, I think will continue to build on our overall knowledge and incrementally we'll knock down each one of these barriers so that five, 10, 15 years from now, we'll look at look back at this as kind of a tipping point in, in, e in being able to address uh, the needs of ultra rare disease patients. Um, and I think now is the time for us to do it. So I'm, I'm very, let's just say optimistic and enthusiastic about putting the consortium in place, getting the pilot started. And as we learn, as PJ mentioned earlier, a lot of the objectives of the pilot is to learn as we go and make incremental improvements. So hopefully that, that helps. Thank you, Bob. Um, you know, as we're nearing uh, the end of our session, um, I was hoping that uh, Joe and PJ can tell us a little bit about uh, where the effort is now, what the plan is, timelines, next steps, just, you know, is, is, if anyone in the audience is interested in, in joining or taking part in this, can they, um, can you give a little bit more detail? I'll leave that to you, Joe. <laughs> Thanks, PJ. Um, so just as a just a, a reminder and kind of the history uh, time to, to put it into perspective, these things start out as a concept. Somebody has an idea. In this case, it was Heaver and and uh, and Michael, who has has been an incredible supporter of this. Um, and and during that time, the, and after that that. Um, initial concept, we spend a fair amount of time trying to put it together in a way that, that we can, we can um, <laughs> articulate to the rest of the folks that are on the uh, steering committees and, and, and at Hever and into a, a, something that says, you know, yeah, that looks like something you really, that really is, is of interest. It's not something that other people are doing. It's, you know, it's clearly uh, non-competitive or, or uh, situation. And, um, you know, we can pre-competitive maybe is a, a better look. And, and, um, um, and it, it's something where, where people can, can work into. That normally takes a fair amount of time, nine months to a year. Uh, we have gotten to the point where the steering committee has said, yes, this is a, this is a great job. While we're doing, putting all of that together, we include everybody, academics and, and, uh, and industry alike, because we want everybody's best ideas. After that, and after we get to the point where there's a, um, it's really clear, this is, this is, we're hoping to move this to launch. What we do um, is, is um, focus the discussions with the, the people who would end up supporting the process. So these are the industry folks, the private uh, foundations, the, the, um, the other, uh, uh, you know, professional groups that might um, put, put money into the, and, and effort into finalizing that concept into something that's executable and has the timelines and milestones and, and clarity that would be necessary for, for Bob to go to Michael and say, I need a million dollars a year or $2 million a year for five years to do this. Here's how it's going to be spent. Here's what it's going to be done. You know, this is, there's a, a certain need for that. And the reason we focus exclusively on the industry folks is because people like Barry and, and others are exactly the people we want part of who, who potentially get the grants <laughs> Right through NIH and 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 uh, and FNIH, and so we don't want them to be conflicted, and, and you know we want to be able to to provide that. So we really focus on the folks who who will will um, will um, uh, uh, end up sponsoring that process to kind of what we you know it's called a white paper in our parlance, but it's it's like that final plan. It normally takes a couple of months. Um, that's what we're doing right now. So. So folks who are interested in being part of that, either as, as Bob said, you know, who did a better j advertising job than I would have done, uh, uh, the people who would either be involved in, in expertise from a, an industry point of view or, a, or, or would support from, a, um, from you know, a financial point of view, this is the time, right, to be, to be bringing them in. We would like to see all of that commitment 
defined by the end of the year so that we could launch either by the end of the year or early next year. Um, and launch would be the, you know, having the beginnings of, of the, um, the BGTC, you know, however that we, we choose to govern it um, and, and begin to start putting out the RFAs um, from an NIH potentially point of view or RFAs from an FNIH point of view. So they, that can be done, done too. So, you know, we'd like to get that started as soon as possible. I know uh, Peter Marks from, from the FDA would like to have started it six months ago, but, you know, uh, we, he's, he's been, uh, he, he certainly would be um, supportive of that. And we would bring them FDA in as well to make sure that, you know, master files for the the products would be um, would be consistent with what we could do so that's the time time frame we're right now in the time of get the package together get it committed and and uh, be able to launch by the end of the year thank you um, so we have I think three minutes left is there anyone else that wants to comment on anything um, that we discussed or did not discuss yeah, I, I can make one comment because this is another area where the NIH has often excelled uh, in being able to educate the next generation of both scientists and providers. So there may be an opportunity through all this to establish means for uh, T32 uh, programs or other, other training grant mechanisms in this area, both in the clinical side and, um, and for those that are going to develop the next methodologies that that will advance the field and, and oh, the ultimate goal of lowering cost and improving safety of these therapies. Great point, thank you. So um, I'd like to thank Joe and PJ and FNIH and NIH for leading this initiative, um, for Barry and Bob and their respective organizations for taking part and being so proactive and active. And uh, if anyone has any questions, um, please uh, send them to Joe or to PJ or to any one of us if, if you think that we can answer. Thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of the conference. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.